You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 4th, 2023. Our topic today, evidence-based treatment of chronic rhinosinusitis. Our presenter is Dr. Anju Peters. She's a professor of medicine in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Evanston, Illinois. All right. Hey, um, thank you so much. I'm Anju Peters from Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, and I'll be talking on chronic rhinosinusitis today, evidence-based treatment. A lot of evidence is on chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, but let's get started. And hopefully you guys have my disclosures. My disclosures are that I do research for Sanofi Regeneron, AstraZeneca, and Merck currently. I also consult for Sanofi Regeneron, Merck, AstraZeneca, and GSK. Previously, I also did research for Optinose and I've consulted with them also. My objectives, today we'll talk about chronic rhinosinusitis a little bit based on endotypes, mostly based on phenotypes. And our goal today is to be familiar with treatments such as biologics, steroids, surgery, antibiotics. Obviously, this is not going to be completely comprehensive. I'd like to show you some of what's more recent and current in the literature. And what I also won't show you is some of the stuff that I'll be presenting at the year in review in a couple of months. So chronic rhinosinusitis, by definition, is inflammation of the nose and paranasal sinuses. And we'll go over the different sinuses. These patients suffer from symptoms for 12 weeks or longer by definition. The classic symptoms would be congestion, drainage, loss of smell, but in addition to symptoms, they have to have some objective evidence of inflammation since we think inflammation underlies chronic rhinosinusitis. That objective evidence can be seen by endoscopy or by CT scan. And here you can see in the bottom, chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps, which is CRS SNP throughout the talk. And you see the pus draining right here. You could see this inflammation by endoscopy, or you could see here's someone's CT that's abnormal, and I'll show you normal CTs and abnormal. This is abnormal. Here's a normal endoscopy. Here's an endoscopy showing you nasal polyps, which throughout the talk is CRS WNP, and that's how you see it in the literature as well. So rhinosinusitis is symptomatic inflammation of the sinuses and the nose. Acute rhinosinusitis is when symptoms are less than four weeks in duration. We're not going to be talking about acute rhinosinusitis today. We're focusing on CRS. Symptoms more than 12 weeks, either CRS with nasal polyps or WNP or CRS SNP, CRS without nasal polyps. So this is the classic phenotypes that we see. And there's more to it, but we'll focus on these two. And I know you guys had a talk on AERD previously by Drew White, which was excellent. So what are the symptoms? As I mentioned, these would be classic sinonasal symptoms. The two main ones we think of are congestion or blockage, nasal drainage, either anteriorly or posteriorly. Individuals with CRS without nasal polyps often will complain of facial pain or pressure. And then patients with nasal polyps in general, although CRS without polyps can also, but one of the cardinal symptoms is reduction or loss of sense of smell, which if you see a patient with sinus symptoms and loss of sense of smell, barring viral things like COVID, think nasal polyps. And endoscopically, you may see inflammation or purulent drainage like I showed you before from sinuses or the osteomedal complex. This is where the sinuses drain or you see an abnormal sinus CT scan. So what is the prevalence of chronic rhinosinusitis? It's actually thought of to be quite common. In general population, we think six to 12% of the population may have CRS. Of those, 20% to 25% are CRS with nasal polyps, and 80% are CRS without nasal polyps. I did not again talk to you about aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, which is a subset of with nasal polyps. 
So what are some of the clinical characteristics of patients with CRS? This is a study that was led by Marielle Benjamin when she was a fellow here at Northwestern. She is now an attending at University of Michigan. And literally she and a few of us went through charts. She started this as a resident, published this in the last month of her uh, fellowship. And you could see the age is very similar. These tend to be a little bit older individuals, significant number of females in CRS without nasal polyps and with nasal polyps pretty similar. Many of these patients have asthma. This is, I want to highlight this because we as allergists see this a lot. So when we see patients with CRS, and one of the things I educate the ENTs is if you see CRS, you really have to look for asthma. In CRS S&P, it's a little less than 40% in our group at Northwestern and an academic center, although we have uh, many of our clinics are around in not in urban area of Chicago and very high in CRS with nasal polyps. Over 50% of patients with CRS with nasal polyps had asthma. Allergic rhinitis right below it, you can see is more than 50% of CRS patients have allergic rhinitis. We won't go into detail as to is it associated with leading to CRS? Does it worsen severity? Um, some data suggests both ways. So in terms of pathogenesis, chronic rhinosinusitis, at least with polyps, we think as type 2 inflammation, and I'll break it down more with you. And you guys have all seen a figure like this where airway lining, whether it be in your nose, your sinuses, your lungs, your gut, is faced by irritants, bacteria, viruses, allergens, pollutants, leads to release of alarmins, IL-25, 33, and TSLP. These then activate your ILC2 cells, can cause Th0 cells to go to become Th2, lead the B cells to release the classic type 2 cytokines, IL-4, 5, and 13. IL-4 and 13 play a role in IgE production, IL-13 in airway remodeling, mucus secretion. IL-5 plays a role in eosinophilic inflammation, as you guys are very well aware of. You know, different things, for example, elevated TSLP, as we know, is found in asthma, but also in nasal polyps. So this is a study done at Northwestern, which kind of changed how we think of CRS endotypes, the classic uh, pathogenesis, the pathophysiology. Atsushi Kato led this work. And what we did at Northwestern under the guidance of Atsushi, we looked at expression of different cytokines in CRS with and without polyps. So here's control ethmoid, ETs, ethmoid tissue, CRS, SNP, ethmoid tissue. Here's nasal polyp, ethmoid tissue, and nasal polyp tissue itself. Previously, we were always taught that CRS, SNP is very much type 1, and you know, interferon gamma would be the classic cytokine. But here you can see, based on tissue looking at it Northwestern, there really was not a higher amount of interferon gamma expression in CRS SNP. In fact, it was very similar. When we think of type 2 cytokines, IL-13, as I showed you before, you can see that IL-13 expression is elevated in nasal polyp tissue compared to control. It's elevated in ethmoid tissue from nasal polyps. In fact, you can see it's even present in CRS without nasal polyps, which previously we thought of as type 1, but now I'm showing you type 2 inflammation CRS SNP. And then looking at type 3 inflammation, was we looked at it based on IL-17A expression. And as you'd expect in CRS, SNP, ethmoid tissue, there was elevation of type 3 cytokine. So putting this all together, here are the different uh, endotypes. Type 1 is in blue, type 2 is in red, type 3 is in yellow. You could see there was a mix of them, and there was a huge percent we don't know what is exactly their endotype. Here is CRS SNP, here is CRS WNP, and you could see that the majority of WNP is blue, which is 87%, but then there is a mix here, it's type 2 and type 3. And when you look at CRS SNP, Again, 55%, so majority, not as much as nasal polyps, but significant CRS SNP had type 2 inflammation. Then you saw a lot of the other stuff in there as well and mixed inflammation. And this has now been reproduced elsewhere as well. 
So keeping that as background that most of CRS, especially CRS with NP is type two, CRS SNP may have more mix, but still has a lot of type two. Let's go over some CT scans. And this is a slide Actually, I made for the American Academy, um, so you can see it as a teaching slide I showed to you guys at board review. So when we think of sinus cavities in uh, in human beings, they are paired. From the black is air, which is good. If you see gray, that's mucosal inflammation. That's not good. Here are frontal sinuses on coronal scan. They're nice and black. Here's the septum right here. You can see a little bit inferior turbinate. Here's your brain. Another coronal view, here's your maxillary sinuses looking nice and black. Here you can see the OMC osteometal complex is draining. Here's your ethmoid sinuses right here in C. And then this view, you can see the sphenoid sinuses right back here, and they're nice and black as well. Here's an axial image. Here's your septum. Here are the interior ethmoids. Here's the posterior ethmoids right here. Here's the sphenoid sinus. And then here you can see the sphenoid sinus again. And then this is a sagittal image. Here's the frontal sinuses, nice and black. Here's the interior ethmoids. Here's the posterior ethmoid. Here's the sphenoethmoid recess kind of dividing here. And then sphenoid sinuses right here. So if Hopefully you guys are getting familiar and see a lot of the scans um, in your uh, clinic as well. I know a lot of you are pediatric trained, but again, you see both. I see mostly adults. Chronic sinusitis is seen in children as well, but not as much as we see it in um, adults, middle-aged adults. So I want you to be familiar with what's called lund mckay scoring. It is a way of scoring sinus CT scans that you will see in a lot of the studies, including the biologic studies. Um, this is something that is in the literature. You know, it's here for you to look at. As long as you're familiar with that, there is some objective scoring. They score maxillary, ethmoid, sphenoid, frontal, osteometal complex. It goes from zero to 24. Zero is good, all black, all air. One is partial opacification. Two is the sinus looking totally gray, and then you could score it. 24 is bad, zero is good. Here's a scan showing some inflammation. Here you could see in the maxillary sinuses, it's all gray. This could be polyp, this could be anything, but it's not normal. There's a little bit of black. And then on the left-hand side, you definitely see more black, but there's still a lot of gray. So you'd rank this as one, this would still be uh, one. You could see some inflammation in the ethmoids. Here's a nice air fluid level in the left maxillary sinus. Here you see some ethmoid inflammation, a little bit on this maxillary sinus too. Here's a scan showing a lot of gray. When you start seeing this kind of gray, you start thinking these are polyps. Here are your eyes just to orient you. Here's the maxillary sinuses on both sides, very little black. And look at the ethmoids. These ethmoids are all gray, so you score them too. So I just really quickly, we focused on type 2 inflammation. I just want to show you some evidence that is shows that type 2 inflammation is associated with worse disease. Same as we think in severe asthma and sinus disease, especially nasal polyps. This is from Japan, the Jezrek study, where they've done a lot of work on this. And what they did, and here you can see EOS and um, histopath, what they did is they looked at their individuals who underwent sinus surgery. Y-axis is recurrence free rate. X-axis is years after operation. The Dotted line here has a lot more eosinophilia, so more severe eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis. Not dotted line is non-eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis. Here's mild and here's moderate. And you can see that the disease recurrence occurs sooner. So your recurrence free rate is lower, the more eosinophilic inflammation you have, showing that type 2 inflammation as measured by eosinophilic inflammation and the pathology is associated with disease recurrence. But then, you know what? We target, I showed you that sinuses, chronic rhinosinusitis could be type two a lot, but it can also be mixed. And why is it important to target type three inflammation, which is neutrophilic or mixed inflammation? And let me show you that evidence. 
So this is a study done by Bockert and colleagues. What they did is here on the bottom is with nasal polyps, here is CRS without nasal polyps. They based it on IL-5, the eosinophilic survival factor cytokine associated with eosinophilia. Here on the bottom is high IL-5, here is IL-5 negative. You could see when there's a lot of IL-5, it tends to be nasal polyps, a lot more asthma. When there's less IL-5, it's CRS S&P and less asthma, and that's all in dark right here. But what I also want you to see, so darker color is higher expression. So a lot of IL-5 here, less IL-5 here. But even in the groups that have a lot of IL-5, you see neutrophilic type of inflammation. There's a lot of IL-17, IL-8, MPO, and the classic inflammatory cytokine of IL-6. So you definitely see it in without nasal polyp, but you also see it in with nasal polyps. Here's a clinical study. I'm sorry this is so busy, but this is a study from Vanderbilt where they looked at their patients with CRS. They ranked them as posse granulocytic, so not as much inflammation, neutrophilic, eosinophilic, and mixed. So here's eosinophilic predominant, neutrophilic predominant, and then the mixed again. And what they did, they looked at something called SNOT22, which I hope you guys are familiar with. It's a quality of life measure, which is used a lot in trials, as well as in uh, clinical care, sinonasal outcome test 22, which scores your in, um, quality of life and symptoms in your nose, the higher the score, the worse. And compared to posse granulocytic, neutrophilic, and eosinophilic, you could see when it's mixed, they actually have higher SNOT 22 scores saying they're worse quality of life. In fact, when they looked at CT scores by Len Mackay, remember zero to 24 with 24 being high, mixed inflammation at higher Len Mackay, suggesting to us that patients with mixed inflammation may actually have more severe disease. There is now more evidence that neutrophilic inflammation and eosinophilic inflammation goes hand in hand. There's a paper in Jackie that I presented in urine review a couple of years ago. Here's another study showing some of this difference in endotype based on age. This is a study published in Jackie a few years ago. They looked at their patient with sinus disease, measured cyt cytokines, and looked at um, bacteria. And what they did is they looked at them as younger and older. Aged is the older individual, younger is right here. You can see IL-8, which represents neutrophilic inflammation, the um, chemokine for neutrophilia, is elevated in older individuals compared to younger. TNF is higher. And then I'm not sure which cytokine I'm missing. Oh, IL-6 also is higher in older individuals. And then interestingly, when they looked at eosinophils per high power field, so type 2 inflammation, it was higher in younger individuals compared to older individuals, while neutrophils per high power field were higher in older individuals, suggesting that the older individuals had more type 3 inflammation. And when you looked at bacteria, pus was higher in the dark blue, which is the older individual. Staph aureus was higher in the older, but not significant, but there was a trend but pseudomonas was higher in older individuals, showing that type 3 inflammation associated with purulent drainage, associated with bacteria in older compared to younger. So not all CRS is completely similar. And hopefully oh, you guys have um, heard, and if not, I want you to know, that, and I, I know Drew talked about this, individuals in Asia tend to have more type 3 or neutrophilic inflammation compared to individuals with CRS in the Western world. However, interestingly, the Eastern population, so Asia also, over time, eosinophilic inflammation is going up. So, you know, I'm showing you all this in the lab. You can do this in clinic. We can just get mucus tissue, take it over right away to lab and say, can you please tell me what endotype it is so I could treat them accordingly? You know, there are some clues, and a lot of this has been done in euphoria, which is our European colleagues looking at respiratory um, and allergic diseases, and there are uh, two or three of us from U.S. that belong to it. But this is from euphoria suggesting type 2 inflammation. If you see elevated eosinophils in the blood, over 150, previously they said 250, but to align it with the asthma literature, if it's over 150 or you see more than 10 eosinophils per high power field, think type 2, IgE over 100, think type 2, 
presence of asthma, although we know asthma can be mixed or non-type 2, but in general, if you see sinus disease and asthma, we think type 2. Allergic rhinitis, possibly type 2. Nasal polyps, if you see, we tend to think type 2. Type 1, 3 are mixed if there's elevated neutrophils in the blood or tissue, low eosinophils, less than 150, low IgE. If we start seeing hypogam, we think it's more type 3 or neutrophilic. And in general, even though CRS SNP has type 2 inflammation, we also know there's more type 3 and type 1 in CRS SNP compared to nasal polyps. So let's go on to treatment. We'll talk about a few. We'll, I'm not going to talk to you about saline rinses, which is something that patients with CRS do, and there's evidence for it. We'll talk about more um, therapies that are tend to be prescribed. So in terms of steroids, we know steroids target type 2 inflammation, and let me share with you some of that. But before we get into some of the evidence, there's actually a Cochrane database review on both nasal and oral steroids. For oral steroids, they said, at the end of the treatment course, two to three weeks, there's improvement in health-related quality of life and symptom severity in patients with CRS with nasal polyps with oral steroids, but no improvement after three to six months. And I'll show you what the evidence is based on. And for CRS SNP, they said more research is needed. So this is an older study um, from Annals of Internal Medicine, but I think it's really worth for us as those who treat sinus disease, and I'm telling you, sinus disease, chronic sinusitis is much more a medical disease than then surgery only every so often. So in this study from Europe, they took patients with nasal polyps, they graded their polyps. Um, what they did is they gave them prednisolone, so oral steroid and intranasal steroid, or they gave them placebo and intranasal steroids. And the way they gave intranasal steroids was first they gave them drops, then switched them over to sprays. And here on y-axis is polyp grading, on x-axis is time. You could see that starting at score of five, those that got oral steroids and then topical steroids, by two weeks, polyp size has gone down and stays down. But by week 28, by six months, no difference between the group that just got topical steroids, which is in that square. In addition, smell, which is told you loss of smell, think polyps, you could see very quickly with oral steroids and topical steroids, smell improves by week two, but then goes back down. It's no longer improved by about six months. So basically for six months, steroid therapy, oral steroids, in addition to topical steroid therapy, seems to help for polyps. And this is from Yardsticks. This is a group of us that together um, did a more of a clinical um, summary of our practice parameters and looking at oral steroid use in nasal polyps from Yardsticks, as well as actually this is from EPOS, the European Position Paper, which is this huge document on treating sinus disease. You can see that EPOS suggested that short course of steroids for two to three weeks is favored for nasal polyps. And then yardstick also, we said, prednisone, 40 to 60 milligrams with a two-week taper. Again, this is consensus. Not all of us agree that you need to start with 60 milligrams and taper it over two weeks. Based on your patients, based on your preference, a steroid course over one to two weeks or as yardstick said, over two weeks, how high you go depends. If you have an older individual with diabetes, I wouldn't go as high as 60. This is a classic paper, older paper from 2008, looking at mometazone. For the longest time, the only drug approved for, I think it was 2018 or so, till then, was only mometazone nasal spray for chronic rhinosinusitis, and that too only for polyps. On y-axis has changed from baseline. Red is mometazone nasal steroid spray, 200 micrograms twice a day. Blue is placebo. And looking from change in polyp score, you can see by one month, Nasal steroid spray, if used the right way, seems to do better than placebo up to four months. Looking at individual symptoms, rhinorrhea, red is mometazone, blue is placebo. By two days, rhinorrhea is improved post-nasal drainage, significantly improved by five days with just a nasal spray twice a day. Looking at nasal congestion, which is really bothersome in nasal polyps, 
Again, by three days, mometazone in red is better than placebo in blue. Smell is improved by day 13. The most important thing is patients don't use their nasal steroids the right way. It's important to tell them to go up, aim it towards the outside of the eyes. And in our up to date, we actually will have a new graphic that is being put in there. Um, so up and to the side, squirt it, breathe in gently, don't sniff it up or it goes down back of your throat. And regular use works much better than intermittent. So one of the questions that comes up should we use steroid nose spray? I just showed you the evidence. Should we be using steroid rinses? And there is, this is a study I wanna show to you. This is a study from Australia and they only had 44 patients. They tried so hard to recruit more, but by the time they were doing the study a few years ago, patients were already being put on steroid rinses by the surgeon, but they took 44 patients with CRS, split half of them to placebo, large volume rinse, or they gave a mometazone one milligrams per side by a nasal steroid spray bottle for 12 months starting one day after surgery, and they all had really good surgery done in tertiary care, or they got mometazone by this large volume steroid rinse bottle, and they got placebo by spray. So the same amount of steroid either given by a large volume rinse bottle or by spray, and what they found was large volume rinse is orange, blue is nasal spray, steroid. Everybody got better, but there was more improvement in those with large volume steroid rinse compared to steroid spray, the same dose given by the spray bottle. When they looked at radiographic severity, they looked at Lan Mackay score that we talked about before. It went down more, so did better with large volume steroid rinse. And when they looked at endoscopic inflammation, it decreased more with large volume steroid rinse compared to the same amount of steroid by a spray bottle. Here is another way to deliver steroid. This is EDS flu. It is approved for nasal polyps. Their studies on with polyps were positive, but it hasn't been approved as of yet. But this is one of their studies from Jackie in 2018. And here you can see EDS flu are all these different colors in orange, gray, and yellowish color. Placebo is in blue. Change in polyp score was more with EDS flu compared to placebo. And then when all of them are EDS flu, even the placebo does better. And you could see that it's significant by week eight. Polyps were eliminated in 25% of their patients in their phase three studies on one side at least. The SNAT22 score sinonasal outcome test improved up to 21.4. They also showed in that study that nasal, oops, sorry, nasal congestion improved. Again, blue is placebo, all the colored orange, gray, and yellow are EDS flu. Um, improved congestion, improved rhinorrhea, improved facial pain pressure and sense of smell. And one part of this, and let me just show you in case you're not familiar, this part goes in your mouth, this part goes in your nose, and you push down on the fluticasone part, you blow on it, and it deposits much higher than a regular old nasal spray would. There's also steroid stents that surgeons can put in place. There are many different ways they deliver the steroids slowly, and these have shown improvement in sinus disease with polyps as well. They are FDA approved. So then, you know, I've shown you there are different ways. There's sprays, there's rinses, there's drops, there's EDS flu. What should we tell our patients? So this is from our practice parameters that were just published, and I chaired it. And uh, the person from task force that was the um, main person in this was Matthew Rink, but there was a big group of surgeons and allergists, well, not a big group, but a small group of us, that really asked a few important questions that when you first look at it, you're like, ah, oh, we know this. But when you really look at what's there, I think it's very useful. So one of the questions was, should intranasal steroids rather than no steroids be used in chronic rhinosinusitis with polyps? 
And what we came up is in people with CRS with nasal polyposis, the guideline panel suggests intranasal steroids rather than no steroids. It's only conditional. The certainty evidence was low. And why was this conditional? And you can go into practice parameters and read the whole way we did the grade uh, scoring, or you could come to the Academy meeting. I think I'm giving a talk much more in detail on this. The reason it was conditional, topical steroids had only a small to moderate treatment effect. Quality of life improved by 6.8 with steroid rinses, 7.86 with EDS flu. But the MID, the minimal important difference of SNOT22 is actually 8.9. Nine, so it wasn't as much. So there was improvement, but not as much. So here is actually a table, and the reference for this is uh, in the next slide, and I'm the last author on it that was published in Jackie last year, which can help you decide what type of steroid to use, topical steroid to use in your patients. We looked at patient important outcomes. We found that the main outcome that people with nasal polyps tend to complain a lot about is nasal obstruction. Smell is also important. So here we looked at SNOT22, health-related quality life, going from 0 to 120. 120 high is bad. We looked at nasal symptoms, especially blockage, based on visual analog score. We looked at smell by something called OPSIT, which is University of Pennsylvania Smell Identification Test. We looked to see if they needed recurrent, if they needed surgery, rescue surgery, we looked at polyp size and adverse effects. Green is among most beneficial, red is among most harmful. Solid line that it is, we have blue solid line among least beneficial. Um, if you see solid line alone, whether it be green or blue, it means high to moderate um, evidence, if you see hashed, it's low or very low or conditional. So if you just look in general at the different steroids, here's EDS flu, here's rinse, here's spray, here's dent, here's your placebo reference, you see no red. So they are pretty well tolerated. You see some green solid. You see some blue among less beneficial. For example, if your patient really wants their smell to improve, then you would say that a stent would be most beneficial. If for them, nasal obstruction or congestion was so bothersome, then stent and spray and EDS flu are similar. Rinse didn't do as well. Overall quality of life got better more with rinse and EDS flu. So you could just kind of compare this with any patient you see. So I did summarize this for you. And this is also in that paper with Bagnani being the first author. Quality of life, EDS or rinse are best. Symptom-wise, spray EDS or stents are better. Smell stent was the best as I showed you. Rescue surgery need, EDS flu does the best compared to others. So moving on from steroids to antibiotics, we use a lot of antibiotics for CRS. In fact, a study from Northwestern shows that outpatient clinic CRS is the number one reason antibiotics were prescribed. And there's a Cochrane database where they looked at five randomized control trials. They looked at systemic and topical antibiotics for CRS. And what they said, we found very little evidence that systemic antibiotics are effective in patients with CRS. They did find moderate quality evidence of a modest improvement in disease-specific quality of life with CRS SNP receiving three months of a macrolide antibiotic, by three months later, there was no difference. And we think this may be an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, this was published in 2016. We have a few more studies since then. So here is the macrolide study that they based the CRS improvement on. This is a European study from 2006. There are other macrolide studies. Unfortunately, the doses are not similar. The antibiotics not similar. But in this study in 2006, they looked at SNOT20. At that time, it was SNOT20, not SNOT22. From baseline to end of treatment, it appeared that SNOT22 quality life got better with roxithromycin, the macrolide. It got better mostly in people who had normal IgE, so those that were non-type 2. However, by End of three months after stopping the medicine, there was no significant improvement. So temporarily, while they're on drug, they do get better in CRS, SNP. 
probably by anti-inflammatory effect. There are other studies that don't show benefit. Here's a study that was published out of Europe looking at methylprednisolone compared to doxy compared to placebo in nasal polyp patients. This is methylprednisolone. You could see polyp score goes down quickly. X-axis is days. This is placebo. The triangle, the uh, square is doxycycline, a macrolide. And there's some improvement with the macrolide that persists on. And they got 200 milligrams of doxy day one, followed by 100 milligrams till day through two through 20. And you could see the steroid was tapered over 20 days. So yes, it appears steroid is good, but then goes back a few days after, you know, by day 80, so not by a few days, but a little bit longer. There is no improvement. Um, I'm sorry, not no improvement. There is going back to baseline here. Placebo really did nothing. Doxy had minimal improvement for nasal polyps. So this is a very interesting study that was after Cochrane database review. This is looking at amoxicillin clavulani, the best antibiotic we think for CRS patients with acute exacerbations. So they took their patients with acute exacerbations who had worsening sinonasal symptoms for four weeks. They put them either on amoxicillin clavulani, so antibiotic or placebo. They all got mometasone nasal spray and they all got saline rinses. So you got baseline treatment that we know there's good evidence for, and you got either antibiotic or placebo starting on day zero through day 14. They followed them along to three months. They looked at their SNOT-22. They did a culture endoscopy and SSA. SSA is a way to look at symptom severity. So if you got antibiotics versus placebo for two weeks with exacerbation of CRS, here is their symptom severity. Amoxicillin clavulanate is in this grayish white black boxes. At 14 days, yes, your symptom severity improved when you got antibiotic, but it also improved if you got placebo, which is in this white. All of them were on rinses, all of them were on nasosteroids. So both did okay. When you looked at SNOT 22, your quality of life actually got better more with placebo no significant change with antibiotic, suggesting that not maybe not everybody needs an antibiotic. And adding antibiotic to what we know works, which is topical steroids and rinses, may not provide additional benefit in general in patients with CRS. It was a small study. Here's a study looking at children who had recurrent acute sinusitis. It was published in Jackie in Practice a few years ago. Um, in these individuals with current acute sinusitis, they either put them on azithromycin Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or placebo. Again, all got nasal steroids. The white boxes baseline grays after they got the azithro. Here's the azithro group, or they got the placebo at the end of a year. You could see number of acute rhinosinusitis episodes went down with Monday, Wednesday, Friday, azithro. No change in placebo. Everyone was on nasal steroids. Quite a few of them were specific antibody deficiency. In this group, who is prone to infections, infectious exacerbations, prophylactic azithro in the small study did show benefit. Number needed to treat was two to prevent one infection. So there are some individuals. This was a different macrolide. Again, it was a study in 2017. So considering surgery for patients with CRS, um, I'm just going to show you one study that the surgeons quote a lot. This was a multi-center study looking at chronic sinusitis survey post-surgery. The higher it goes up, the better you do. Blue is chronic sinusitis symptoms, orange is medication, and CSS total is in gray. Here is pre-op. When they did follow up on these patients, and they had... Uh, I can't remember what percent actually followed up, but it shows that symptoms get better, less medications are needed after surgery. And this is something called SF60 health utility. Mean normal US population is 0.8. One would be perfect. Pre-op, these patients started at 0.67 and did improve and follow up with surgery all the way to 0.79. So this is a study that I want to show you. Can surgery target type 2 inflammation? This is an AERD study. You know, we don't do as much aspirin desensitization. We hardly ever do it now, I feel. But this was published in 2019. And what they found, 
after surgery, they had 28 patients who had a positive challenge pre-surgery, all of them reacted to aspirin. They were AERD patients. But after surgery, 43% with a history of poly positive challenge did not have any symptoms during aspirin challenge and had a negative challenge. So if you do it after surgery, which we often do, you may potentially get a negative challenge. What they also showed pre and post surgery, blood eosinophils counts went down from 700 in the periphery to 300, and the reaction to aspirin less decreased in FEV1 post surgery. They looked at LTE4, leukotriene E4, and found that. Before surgery, it was higher in the urine. After surgery, it was lower at baseline. And when they did an aspirin uh, desensitization, two hour after reaction before surgery, your LTE4 went up more. But if you did a desensitization after uh, surgery, you could see it did not go up as much, suggesting that, yeah, even surgery can target type 2 inflammation. So let me show you this study from 2022. Let me get a sip of water. This is a study from Netherlands where they took patients with nasal polyps, 15 centers in Netherlands, open study. You could do whatever kind of surgery, but you had to do a significant amount. So you had to make sure you did enough surgery, but it was up to the surgeon how much they did. They had 238 patients randomized over 12 months either to surgery and medical therapy or medical therapy alone. 23 crossed over, just so you remember that. So in their patients in blue, those who got medical therapy alone versus purple is surgery and medical therapy. Here they're looking at SNOT 22. Remember the MCID was nine. At baseline, they had bad SNOT 22 in their 50s. At three months, it appears surgery group does better. By six months and 12 months, really not much difference between surgery and medical group. When they looked at other outcomes, first one was polyp size. This is medical and surgery in purple. Blue is medical therapy alone. And you'd want the surgeon to have the polyp size go down, and you'd see post-surgery it does go down. With medical therapy, it goes down some, but not that much. EPOS is the European position way to say controlled versus uncontrolled. Despite medical therapy and surgical therapy at one year, 46% were uncontrolled. In the medical group, 64% were uncontrolled. So really, these people are not doing so well. Loss of smell or anosmia, 54% still had lost the smell. 52% with medical therapy had lost the smell. So similar, over 50%. Whether you got surgery and medical therapy or you got medical therapy, still not controlled, loss of smell. So you could look at those numbers. Steroid use was slightly um, less, not I shouldn't say slightly, but steroid use was less in the medical and surgical group compared to medical therapy alone. It's a difference of 316 milligrams through the course of the year. No difference in antibiotic use, suggesting, you know, surgery versus medical therapy, there wasn't that much difference. And important thing to note is that study was done pre-biologic. So bringing us to biologics, this is a study looking at polyp recurrence after sinus surgery. It was a multi-center study. They had 244 patients that followed up, 363 underwent surgery. This is pre-op. Gray is polyp, the hash lines is edema and inflammation. At six months, polyps go down after surgery, but you can see there's still a lot of inflammation. By 18 months, 40% have recurrence of polyp, over 80% have recurrence of inflammation after getting good surgery. Who are these people? These are people with aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. These are people with asthma. These are people with AFRS. So moving on to biologics quickly, we have about 15 minutes. Biologics are approved for polyps. We've talked about this before. Currently, biologics that are approved include dupilumab, which targets IL-4 receptors, so blocks IL-4 and IL-13. Meplizumab, which blocks IL-5, and Benra had positive studies, but is not approved for polyps yet. It targets IL-5 receptor alpha. Omelizumab is approved for nasal polyps, targets IgE. Um, Tezi is studying polyps right now, blocks TSLP. In our practice parameters, we said 
in people with nasal polyps, the guideline panel suggests biologics rather than no biologics. The strength was conditional. The certainty of evidence was better than with topical steroids. It was moderate. Why did we say conditional? Because people have other options. They could use just topical steroids. They could get surgery. Or if they have AERD, they could do aspirin therapy after desensitization. The preference among patients was different. In our large practice parameters group, there were about five patients that came on. One was my patient who got really upset at us that we said this was conditional. She said she had severe asthma, AERD. She said for her, biologics brought back her sense of smell, improved her asthma. She th thinks it's really important, but based on evidence, it is conditional because other people could just keep getting surgery. So here are some of the phase three studies. This is sinus 24, y-axis change in polyp size from baseline, x-axis is time. Blue is dupilumab with topical steroid. This in, uh, maroon color is just topical steroid, or we could call it placebo. Polyp score goes down to week 24. Once dupilumab is stopped, polyp size comes back up. Nasal congestion improves in the blue with dupilumab comes back up once off treatment. Other things, blue is dupilumab, gray is placebo, lung Mackay CT scores they showed improved with dupilumab. Um, symptom score improved or went down, blue is dupilumab. Opposite sense of smell improved with dupilumab and SNOT22 improved significantly. Looking at need for steroids in their phase three studies or rescue surgery, placebo or just topical nasal steroid sprays in maroon, blue, Squares are dupilumab. There was significant decrease in need for steroids in surgery. There was 74% reduction in steroid need and 83% reduction in these phase three clinical trials. Mepolizumab, which is the SYNAP study, also has improved. They looked at nasal polyp score. Um, again, these are all very severe uh, patients in all these studies. MEPO is in orange. Improvement in polyp score, they looked at it by median, goes down by about one. Nasal obstruction improved with mepolizumab compared to placebo. In their study, they showed reduced need for surgery as well. Omelizumab showed decrease in polyp one and polyp two studies in their phase three studies. Omelizumab is in the red and the blue improved compared to this dark blue uh, triangle and this open square compared to nasal steroid spray, improved by a mean change of about 1.25 or so. Nasal congestion improved with omelizumab compared to placebo. Both omelizumab and MEPO now have studies that show once you go off treatment, disease comes back. So how do you then decide which one to use? This is the meta-analysis reported by by Paul Oikman, and then we use this meta-analysis for our practice parameters. We divided it again into patient important outcome and surrogate outcomes such as polyp scores, CT scores. Remember, to these patients, obstru nasal obstruction symptoms are very important, smells important. Dark green is among most beneficial, light green is among intermediate benefit. Red is among most harmful and you don't see any red. Solid line is solid certainty. Um, high to moderate certainty, and then shaded line is low to very low certainty. For example, if you look at quality of life or SNOT22, dupilumab and omelizumab are dark green, so they do the best compared to MEPO and Benra. If you look at sense of smell, dupilumab did best among the other biologics. You could look for rescue surgery, et cetera, based on what patient you're seeing, what you think is important. This table guides you. This is, we just published this. This is from, we had a meeting in, Eufor, uh, in Belgium looking for guidelines when you should start biologic treatment. These are European guidelines. We in US have our practice parameters, but they suggested that every patient should have had surgery. We don't say that. Um, they should have some evidence of type two inflammation, have severe disease, quality of life impairment, loss of smell, having comorbid asthma, pushes you towards a biologic, especially if it's not controlled. Here are how you can guide type 2 inflammation or tell how they have type 2 inflammation. And they suggest have three criteria. You know, some of the things that come up when I think of it, should we use biologics in people before or with surgery? I think so in those with severe asthma that are not controlled. 
ask for an exacerbated respiratory disease often yes because this group and we have evidence published from northwestern and elsewhere this is the group that the disease comes back obviously if surgery fails and people are symptomatic biologic for polyps would make sense if they're poor surgical candidates, if they have comorbidities, they have atopic dermatitis, they have chronic urticaria that needs a treatment. Not clear when to use as if it's just polyp without asthma. Should we only use it in surgical failure? Should we use it with surgery, before surgery? When and for how long should we use it? We now have data showing that disease comes back when you stop it. However, we also have data for a while people do better. There's a study I'll show you in year in review that you could spread out the DUPI. I didn't show you the every four week data, but we have now real world data. Should we do it pre op in high risk patients to prevent recurrence? What we didn't talk about it costs. These are so expensive. Um, how long to use it for? There's data starting to come up, but it's not clear. And sadly, in polyps, CRs with polyps, we have no biomarkers that tell us who's a good candidate, who's not, who will respond, how long to leave people on it. Let's end with just very quickly IgG therapy for CRS. Um, you know, this is another thing that we've looked at. This is by Anjani Kaswani, who's now the chief at GW um, for allergy. When we looked at REDW, and there were two studies we looked at, they were very similar. About 5.9% of our patients with CRS, when we looked at between 2010 and 2013, in those we evaluated for immunodeficiency, 5.9% had CVID, about 24% had specific antibody deficiency, mostly CRS, SNP, and then about more than half were normal. Again, these were all individuals that we thought, so had a higher likelihood of having immune problems. Most of these people get treated with antibiotics, surgery, and do just fine. Very few of these people need immunoglobulin replacement. Here's a study from Walsh and colleague. This is not a Northwestern study. They looked at sinusitis episodes per year and found that pretreatment to post-treatment sinusitis episodes as measured by antibiotic use and exacerbations went down in their 21 patients with immunoglobulin replacement. We say it's the CVID patients that need it. Very rare patient with specific antibody deficiency needs immunoglobulin therapy. So how to measure endotypes? We talked about this a little bit, how you can tell they have type two inflammation, how you could tell clinically it's type one or type three. This is not, you know, this is my way of thinking it. Again, asthma could be T2 or non-T2, but it helps somewhat. These polyps tend to be type two. So how do we think about se severe CRS or how I think about it? Everybody that comes tells me they have CRS. I evaluate them for allergies. I treat their allergies. Even if allergies is not causing CRS, allergies causing a lot of their symptoms and inflammation. We treat, there's good, good evidence topical steroids work for CRS. We know they work for allergic and non-allergic rhinitis, so they all get topical steroids. Based on their preference, either rinses or sprays, or if they have polyps, EDS flu may be considered. I sometimes give them, or if it's polyps, I often give them a short course of oral steroids. If they're not polyps, I don't always give oral steroids. If they're not polyps, I give them oral antibiotics. Sometimes with polyps, I'll give doxy based on that study I showed you. If they still don't do well, we do culture-driven antibiotics often. Um, and culture would be by endoscopy. We work very closely with our surgeons. In fact, I probably work close to, more closely with my surgeons and do joint clinics often than my other colleagues. If they still fail, they get surgery. This targets type two and type three inflammation. There's data, surgery reduces antibiotics. I showed you that quickly. If they still don't do well, we can consider biologics. If they still don't do well, we do macrolides as an anti-inflammatory. Sometimes aspirin desensitization, rarely IgG therapy, all the while thinking of comorbidities, sinus CT scan somewhere around here, CBC with diff, looking for eosinophils, looking to see do they have enough white blood cells, IgE, allergy evaluation. We didn't even talk about asthma. We could go on and on about that. Spirometry, consider immune workup if they don't get better. 
always shared decision making, which is on the college site. Um, it's 1055. We went quickly in the end. There's a lot. But I wanted to leave you guys a little time to ask about questions. Thank you, Dr. Peters. That was fantastic. Let's open it up to the live audience for questions, please. A quiet crowd today, so um, I appreciate the review. Uh, you may have addressed this along the way, but the use of topical steroids, um, my recollection, and we're double dosing compared to treatment for allergic rhinitis. Is that correct? So that's actually a really good question, and I did not address it, but I showed you the data on the study for mometazone. Yeah. So what is approved for mometazone for nasal polyps is two sprays twice a day, each nostril. Very important. Use the right technique. Like I said, it's also now in the process of getting placed and up to date, which I help edit with, and my colleagues are all, Matthew Rankin uh, is also on it. Um, but for allergic rhinitis, we say two squirts once a day, but polyps, we typically say twice a day. We have EDS flu, which gives you higher dose too. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, I think Dr. Dr. Fortnoy Dr. has Peters, a question too. I had one question, and you, you might have addressed this and I might've missed it, but. What are your thoughts about the use of afrin as a decongestant? Oh, I did not address it at all. So again, in an hour, you just, this is something I base my whole life on, right? So I can't tell you all in one hour, but it, it's an excellent question. Use of afrin. I definitely recommend afrin in patients that are swollen. I will tell them to, when I look at them, they're very edematous. You know, they'll put a nasal spray, it's all gonna come out. So I tell them to use afrin. There's data you could use afrin for up to a month with topical nasal steroids. But in general, I don't tell people to do it. I say use Afrin short term. I say use it for about a week, stop it, and then your nasal steroids will work better. I also will use Afrin sometimes ahead of pa in patients with turbinates that are huge. If Afrin works, then turbinate reduction might work better, and we can talk about that in urine review. In individuals with sinus disease, I'll tell them to use Afrin prior to descent when they fly. Um, I definitely see rhinitis medicamentosa where people then stay on it forever. So I warn them not to use it regularly. Yeah, so I usually ask my patients who say that they have stuffy nose, is it so stuffy that you can't sleep at night? Because if they can't sleep at night, despite using fluticasone or a nasal steroid, adding Afrin can sometimes give them relief. And yeah, you're very right And about that. You know, we didn't talk as much about what symptoms are so bothersome, although in passing, I told you, there's a good study done out of UK saying nasal congestion bothered people the most. I mean, think about it. If you can smell, I don't know about you, but I have rhinitis. I have chronic rhinosinusitis. This nighttime congestion is really bothersome. Yeah, particularly, um, particularly if you use a CPAP machine because then you can't control your sleep, your, uh, sleep apnea. I think that is such a good point. Um, you know, that sleep apnea is one of our treatable traits for asthma. Um, every patient of mine who comes in for nose, sinus, asthma, anything gets asked about sleep apnea. We have an excellent uh, sleep clinic, but if your nose doesn't work well, it's so hard to keep a mask on. Okay, well, I think we're at, at the end of the hour. Again, Dr. Peters, we appreciate your expert uh, review of chronic rhinosinusitis. Thanks for being here today. Hey, thank you so much. Again, come to the college here in review, and hopefully I'll see you guys elsewhere too. Bye-bye. That'd be great. Thanks so much. You're